Hello, I'm going to talk to you about the change of phase. And uh, here we have some examples of phase change. Melting, freezing, evaporation, and condensation. And we're going to use water as our medium here for discussion today. And first of all, I'm going to talk to you about the melting of ice. Here I have a block of ice. And this ice is currently at a temperature of about uh, minus 2 degrees uh, Celsius. And of course, it's possible to have ice at a much lower temperature. But when you add heat to cold ice, when it's below zero degrees, that heat goes into raising the temperature of the ice. And it takes about uh, half a calorie to raise the temperature of one gram of ice through one Celsius degree. Of course, here we have a block of ice that's much larger than one gram. But uh, nevertheless, it takes a certain amount of heat energy to raise the temperature of ice from below freezing up to the freezing point. Once that ice has reached the freezing point, then it begins to melt, and that's when we begin talking about a change of phase. Change of phase would be uh, when the ice begins to melt. So here I have some ice that's in the process of melting, and it's mixed with water. And when ice gets to zero degrees and begins to melt, then the temperature stays constant at that zero degree mark. And so when we have ice and water mixed together, the temperature should be very close to uh, zero degrees Celsius, which is the freezing point or the melting point of ice. Measured on this digital thermometer here, and uh, we see that the uh, temperature of the ice water mixed Mixture here is uh, very close to zero degrees and ideally would be zero degrees if we had uh, equilibrium conditions. There we see the temperature is uh, zero degrees for the ice water mixed. And as we continue to add heat to the system, the heat goes into melting the ice and converting the solid ice into liquid water. It takes 80 calories per gram to melt ice and that happens normally at a temperature that remains constant. Uh, next, what I'd like to do is take this ice water, which uh, we just measured the temperature of to be zero degrees Celsius, and add some heat to it. Here I have a Bunsen burner and a stand here to, uh, to warm this uh, water up, or try to warm the water up. Now, it turns out when we measure the temperature of the ice water, even while heat's being added to it, as long as we keep it in equilibrium conditions, the heat is going into melting the ice, and not into raising the temperature. So we see the temperature is still very close to zero degrees. And it'll stay that way. Ideally, it would be right at zero degrees. And stay that way until all of the ice is melted. Again, it takes 80 calories per gram to melt the ice. And once all the ice is melted, then the heat energy will go into raising the temperature of the water. It takes one calorie per gram to raise the temperature of water through one Celsius degree. So uh, the ice is melting, temperature is staying pretty much uh, constant at zero degrees, except near the bottom where the uh, water is a little bit warmer than it is up near the ice water at the top. And so the heat is going into melting the ice, and we're undergoing a phase change called melting. The reverse of that process would be uh, when you cool it down and take heat away, and water freezes to form ice. So now we have uh, most of the ice uh, has now melted and uh, the heat energy is going into raising the temperature of the water and that heat will be continued to be added to the water until all of the water gets up to uh, the boiling point temperature. And uh, let's just measure the temperature of the water here while the, uh, while the heat is being added and uh, cooling the thermometer down from room temperature down to about... Uh, 16 or 17 degrees here already, 18 degrees. So the temperature of the water is increasing and we'll let that heat continue to add to the water and talk just a little bit about the evaporation process while that heat is being added. To, even before we get to the boiling point, water is evaporating at the surface. And it turns out that it takes uh, about uh, 540 calories per gram to evaporate water, to change water from the liquid state to the vapor or gas state. So that's another phase change. When water evaporates, it changes from liquid to gas. Uh, that's called evaporation. The reverse of that process is when gas or vapor condenses to form liquid water. That's just the reverse of evaporation in much the same way that freezing is the reverse process of melting.
Now the temperature of this water is increasing and uh, eventually we'll get to the boiling point temperature and then we'll discuss uh, what happens when water boils. The temperature now is uh, about 39 or 40 degrees Celsius and uh, increasing. And we'll come back in uh, just a minute or two and pick that up just before it uh, boils. Uh, now we, we're going to measure the temperature of the water here again. We've been adding heat for a few minutes. And the temperature of the water is now up to about 88, 87 degrees Celsius and getting closer to the boiling point uh, temperature. Uh, let's talk about what happens when water actually boils. The boiling process is when the water evaporates below the surface. So those bubbles of water form below the surface, and we see that's taking place now down near the bottom where the temperature of the glass is a little bit higher than the boiling point temperature, and so the water near the bottom is all, already boiling. When the entire mass of water gets boiling there, then water uh, bubbles are forming below the surface, and then the buoyant force pushes those water bubbles up to the top, and that's what boiling is all about. We note that the boiling temperature in our laboratory today is about 94 or 95 degrees Celsius. Um, the reason that the boiling point temperature is below 100 degrees Celsius is because the pressure in our laboratory right here today is less than the pressure at sea level. At sea level, water would boil at 100 degrees, in our laboratory here, it boils at a lower temperature because the pressure is lower. In fact, I have a barometer here, and we could measure the uh, height of this mercury column barometer. In our laboratory today, the height of this barometer is about uh, 25 inches of mercury, whereas at sea level, the height of a mercury column barometer is about 30 inches of mercury. So the pressure is lower, and that's why the boiling point temperature is lower. It's easier for the water to boil for those uh, vapor bubbles to form below the surface when the pressure is less. The greater the pressure, the higher the temperature has to be for water to boil. Now, now we can demonstrate that the uh, boiling point temperature depends on the atmospheric pressure by uh, turning off the heat and letting the water cool off a little bit and then reboiling the water, not by raising the temperature but by reducing the pressure. Uh, next what I'd like to do is uh, take some water that we just uh, got from the tap and we're going to boil this water not by raising the temperature but by lowering the atmospheric pressure. First let's measure the temperature of this water and we see that it's about uh, 27 or 28 degrees on the Celsius scale quite a bit below the temperature of the boiling water that we had just measured previously to be around uh, 90 degrees Celsius. And I'm going to put this uh, water on this plate here. Uh, here I have a vacuum system uh, where I have a hose connected to this plate and through this hole I will pump the air out of this. When I turn the switch on there's a vacuum pump in the back room and that will evacuate whatever is connected up to this system. So to uh, properly uh, prepare this for the experiment, I want to put a little uh, pressure gauge in the system in the form of a little blue balloon here and uh, make sure we don't cover up that hole. And we'll watch hap what happens to the balloon and we'll watch what happens to the uh, water as we evacuate uh, this chamber. I previously prepared this with a good vacuum seal on there so that uh, we can pump the air out of this and uh, turn the pump on and uh, let's observe what happens. We notice that the balloon is blowing itself up as the atmospheric pressure is reduced. Pressure is still dropping. And now the water begins to boil. Not by raising the temperature, but by reducing the atmospheric pressure. 
Another aspect of uh, change of phase has to do with evaporation and the cooling that takes place as a result of evaporation. Now it turns out that uh, evaporation uh, which takes place for example at the surface, uh, those molecules that leave the surface and become part of the atmosphere get their energy from those molecules from uh, the pool from which they came. Now in a given uh, sample of water like I have here, the molecules are moving at various speeds. Some molecules are moving faster than others and some are moving slower than others. At a given temperature, there's an average kinetic energy and as we know, the temperature is related to that average kinetic energy. The higher the average kinetic energy, the higher the temperature. But even at a given temperature, there's a distribution of speeds of the molecules. So at the surface, those molecules that are most likely to leave will be those molecules that are moving the fastest. The fast molecules will leave, the slow ones remain, and uh, we see that uh, what happens when water evaporates is the fast or the hot molecules leave, that causes the slow ones to remain, and uh, the slow ones correspond to colder molecules, and that's what evaporation cooling is all about. As an example of evaporation cooling, where the fast molecules leave and the slow molecules remain, I'd like to uh, now measure the relative humidity in the room. To do that, I'll use a little instrument here called a sling psychrometer in which I have a wet bulb and a dry bulb on two identical thermometers. Now, uh, as the evaporation cooling takes place on the wet bulb, the temperature will drop and it turns out that if the relative humidity were 100%, the air would be totally saturated and there would be just as much evaporation as condensation take place, the two would cancel each other out and there would be no evaporation cooling take place. But if the relative humidity is below 100%, then there will be some evaporation cooling and we'll see that the wet bulb will be cooler than the dry bulb. Let's measure those temperatures. I'll move this uh, in a circular fashion like this to simulate the wind blowing past it so that we don't uh, saturate it right near the bulb and uh, with water vapor so that uh, we can get the true relative humidity at a uh, typical uh, region in the uh, room here and uh, then we'll go to the chart and measure what that is. I'll read the temperature on the uh, on the uh, dry bulb, it's just about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and the temperature on the wet bulb is just about uh, 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have a temperature difference of 6 degrees with an actual temperature of uh, 70 degrees. We go over to the chart here, we find that when the temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit and a temperature difference of 6 degrees Fahrenheit, we run down here and we find there's a relative humidity of about 72%. So that's uh, one way that relative humidity is determined.